uh, it's not really a story, but a, you know, a way of us reading. I uh, have something, uh, a story to kind of get us all the way. An economist who read 2 Peter 3.8 was amazed. It says, Lord, he said, is it true that a thousand years for us is like a minute for you? And God answered, yes. Then a million dollars to us might, must be like one penny to you, the economist said. Well, yes, said God. Will you give me one of those pennies? <laughs> the economist asked. All right, I will, the Lord said. Wait here a minute. <laughs> That's kind of one of the things that we have a problem with, is our, our, our meaning of time and how things work for us and, and what's important to us. Uh, I'm going to read uh, several stories today, and a lot of them have to do with wealth. It's kind of interesting. But our story, uh, our, our scripture is in 1 John, we're continuing there, and this one is chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not believe does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Back in uh, the first chapter, it says, we talked about this, it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So we're talking about that same verse and about that, that idea of sin. The other night, the dogs get me up at least once a night. It's usually re between three and four. Most of the time, they don't really want to go outside because they need to go outside. They want to go outside because they're hot, because they both have a lot of hair, and they get hot in the house. So... I am very used to sitting out there for a while. Sometimes I fall asleep and I stay awake for hours. But, you know, most of the time I, I, they wake me up, I lick them in the face, which is very unpleasant. So we go inside. Um, but I was, the other night, it was after a rain, but it wasn't raining that day. It was nice that day. And I was watching the, the sun, well, I have to tell you, like at 4.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock, it's light enough that you can see things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was looking out there, and we have this oak tree that uh, doesn't leaf until it's pretty late. So its leaves were just small, and they were very flexible. And I was watching them then the breeze, and it really did look like, um, in the, the Psalms, there's a psalm that I couldn't tell you what top, which one it was, but it talks about the trees clapping. And I was watching these leaves, and they looked like they were dancing. Because they were just, you know, they were so flexible that they were twisting and turning and everything. And, and I thought, that's so great. That's what I love about this time of year. You know, because everything comes out and it looks so good. I have planted seeds this year, which I haven't done in a long time for flowers. And they're like, mm, maybe an eighth of an inch tall right now. And I'm just like, come on, let's go. And then I have to remind myself, it's April. <coughs> But I'm ready for everything to be up and out. And I started thinking about how, how wonderful it is to have all this newness and how it, the green of spring is just not to be. I've, I've tried to duplicate it with paint. I don't know how many times. can't be done. There's something about it. It lives. It's like having this process of chlorophyll all the time. It always looks so green. And I thought about that, and I thought about how... Um, you know, the world has a process. It has cycles. It goes through and it dies, and then it comes to life again. And, and then we talk about Jesus, dying in Jesus and coming to a new life again. And it's one of those things where we 
we don't really think about that. <coughs> that night, when those leaves were dancing, I could understand what it was like, because those leaves are going to die and fall off that tree, and I'm going to have to break them up. And so that's something that I know was going to happen over and over again. And I thought about the fact that with new life, and Easter is our time for saying, you know, here it is, here's the new life, we've got new life in Christ. It's over and over again, that's what Easter is for, to remind us that we have new life in Christ. That we have that hope, you know, a new hope, uh, new possibilities, new growth for all of us. And, uh, you know, we also get to change the clothes in our closets and the shoes on our feet. I have sandals on today, I saw a bunch of sandals last week, I went, I'm doing that. So, you know, it's one of those exciting things you have that change everything. And it's something that, oddly enough, as much as humans dislike change, we really like spring. So it's one of those things that it, we enjoy. It calls to us to renew our faith, to walk the walk, talk the talk. We talked about that last week. Now, one of the things that we don't understand is that our identity is, should be Christian. It is Christian. If we adhere to the morality, to the teachings of Jesus, we are Christian. If someone publicly proclaims to be a Christian but practices ways of being that are not love, it says in here, you're a liar. So we have to think about that when we are walking through life. You know, we have those bad days where we don't care what anybody else thinks. We're just going to be grumpy about everything. And that reflects on of us. And so, you know, we, we kind of make people our victims of our bad moods. And it's one of the things that probably if we could cure ourselves of that, people would know we were Christians. Because that's being kind to that person when you don't feel kind. And Jesus calls us to be like that. You know, in verse 3, it says, all who have hope in him purify themselves. That's because we have forgiveness. We don't have to live with the things that we do that are wrong. We can go back to that person that we were rude to and say, I'm sorry, I'm in a bad mood. I shouldn't have taken out of you. I'm sorry. We can be forgiven. Jesus forgives us constantly for the things that we do. All we have to do is confess them. Say, wow. Just being a jerk. And it happens. We get to purify ourselves. Because when God forgives us, it's gone. There's no remembering it. You know, it's forgotten. We don't do that. We remember it. But even if we forget, we still remember it. But God does it. It doesn't count against you. It's no three strikes you're out. It's over and over and over again. It's a process, just like the cycles of the earth. It's a process that God gave us so that eventually we'll get it right. That eventually God can love us fully because we love God fully. And that's what changes us. So we have this kind of process thing where we hope in Christ. And when we hope in Christ, our perspective might change. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read you a few stories to illustrate that kind of perspective that changes us. This is from a young man. Before I decided to live for Christ, I'd party with friends. As a guy who wanted to be a cool and popular jock, I'd drink, act stupid, and end up making a fool of myself. But I didn't care because I was popular and one of my school's top athletes. As for God, I thought he was for weak people that a lot. If Christians tried to tell me about Jesus, I'd make fun of them. Then something happened my sophomore year that changed everything. My sister Ashley, who was a freshman at the time, was riding in a car driven by one of her friends. Worried about getting home late, Ashley's friends started speeding. The car hit a rough railroad track and flipped over. Ashley soon lay in the hospital on life support, very close to death. At first I was angry with God for what happened to my sister? I shouted, if you are who you say you are, how could you let this happen? As angry as I was at God, I began to think about how much I loved my family. I had cared about them before, but all those trips to the hospital brought us so much closer. 
all the times we cried together. My family suddenly seemed more important than anything else in the whole world. Even though my sister managed to survive, we were told her brain injury was so severe she'd probably never walk or talk again. But in the months that followed, I helped coach her as she struggled to stand and then eventually take a few tiny steps. I listened in amazement as she began to put words together and form sentences. Very slowly, she was getting better. And very slowly, I was starting to change. I thought a lot about God in this place and everything that happened. Instead of blaming God for the accident, I began to thank God for my sister's life and for my family. I also began to see that all those things I'd lived for, like partying and acceptance by pop the popular crowd, weren't really important. Even sports no longer seemed important. I started going to youth group and found I liked having conversations with my friends about God and Christianity. I wanted to know as much as I could about following God. During my junior year, I committed my life to Christ. You can see in that the change of heart from being angry with God to thanking God for his sister's life. For that change of heart that caused the transformation in how he responded to God. The next story is kind of the same. My wife Angie went to a rough high school. There were a few Christians there apart from one teacher, David Button, who taught manual arts. Years after leaving Button's classroom, dozens of his former students became believers. Many have entered the ministry and become pastors and missionaries. I tracked down Button, who is now 70 years old and retired, and he was stunned with emotion when I told him of the many conversions of his former students. I asked him how his influence had brought such a harvest. He told me that times, at many times that he had prayed softly over his classes as he sat at his desk and watched him work. Apart from that, he had done nothing to influence the students for Christ. The com only common point of spiritual connection the students shared was that they were prayed over by that teacher. He walked the walk. He prayed over those kids. And his prayers were answered. Okay, here's another one. Last one. A man opens a newspaper and discovers it is six months in advance of the time he lives. <laughs> Sounds like something out of Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone, yeah. Uh, reading through the newspaper, he discovers stories about events that have not yet taken place. He turns to the sports page and sees scores of games that have not yet been played. He turns to the financial page and discovers that the rise or fall of different stocks and bonds. He realizes this information can make him a wealthy man. A few Large bets on an underdog team can make him wealthy. Investments in stocks that are now low that will go high can fatten his portfolio. He is totally delighted by this opportunity. He turns the page and comes to the obituary column and sees his picture and his story. Everything changes. The knowledge of his death changes his view about his wealth. There is a change in perspective that's very easy to see that his priorities became different once he knew that he also had only six months to live. Our identity is in Christianity. Our way of being is following Jesus Christ. When the writer of 1 John says, no one who abides in him, Jesus, sins, he's not saying the person doesn't sin. We are all less than perfect. But we have God who came to earth to show us what we could be. That God loves us, and through Jesus' sacrifice, we are forgiven our sins when we confess and choose to renew our commitment to following Jesus. When God forgives, it's a race, like I said before, gone. And the expectation is that we won't commit that sin again. But since we are not living in the kingdom of God, our struggles are very real. But our Savior saves. We each and all together need to make sure that the world knows us by our love. And it takes time, a process, and an ability to see another perspective and to pray for a new way of seeing and hearing and following Jesus. If you're not sure about what that really means, get a red-letter Bible and read all the red letters. 
There's a lot that Jesus doesn't say. Unlike God's laws in the Old Testament, Jesus left it broad. Love. Love one another. <coughs> love God. So that means we have to decide what that looks like. But it is that we are supposed to love one another. And he says things like, don't judge. We're all children of God. We're all going to fall short of an expectation. Maybe we need to treat people fairly and don't gouge. I watched the, I think it was the Facebook game, not the hockey game, because I was flipping back and forth. But um, there was a ad on there for Ikea, and it said, yes, prices have gone up, but we found a way to go down. I thought, oh my gosh, that's the first time I've heard anybody who has a pocket on the consumer saying that I'm going to lower my prices so you, and that's what he says. They say, we're going to lower our prices so that you can live good. And, you know, it's that for furniture and better that and everything. And I thought, that's true. We don't treat each other fairly. Ever. Because money is the most important thing, not people. And what's going to happen is one of these days, we're going to come to a great realization that people are our life. They're what gives us life. They're what makes life good. And we're going to stop doing that. And we have to know what is best for everyone. We can't need to quit making victims out of people. We keep have to quit, you know, putting them in pockets and saying, oh, these people are this, or these people are that, or whatever. We need to have no victims. And love is observing. Us watching and knowing what people really, really need in their lives. Because we all need different things. Some of us need to help. And some of us need help. And some of us will be both at the same time. Actually, pretty much all of us are the same at the same time. We need love and we want to give love. And all of this we need to do together. That is what church is for. This is a big fellowship of people that are trying to love all the time. So we need to have no judgment on one another and don't have put expectations on people that are only your own expectations. That's part of that red letter Bible reading. You have to notice that Jesus doesn't judge. He might get angry with somebody. He might call them a hypocrite. He might be, but he's doing it for their good. Loving people doesn't mean you're a doormat. It means that you know what is right. So we can do that. And we can love one another. And we can show the world what love is all about. Amen. Amen. Alrighty. Let us move on to Oh, how he loves me.